launch and uh, we, I won't make this boring. So I don't, if you've come to Bio IT World, I've been to every Bio IT World since the beginning, all of them, with Tom. So um, my partner, Chris Dagdigian, is a, a keynote speaker every year. He closes out Bio IT World and he's known for talking fast and it has a huge slide deck. He'll do 120 slides in 30 minutes. I just want to let you know, I'm not him at all. I'm actually going to be the opposite. So I'm going to talk slow, and I have I want to get to Mason as quick as possible because the story of recursion is really an impressive story. Um, so my job at BioTeam, I am one of the co-founders of BioTeam. 20 years ago, we founded this company to serve the needs of the life sciences community at the intersection of science, technology, and data. So here we are, data products, thinking about what is that? What is a product? What, is, what are data products? Um, about two years ago, I started doing market research and spoke to Mike Montello at GlaxoSmithKline. I talked to John Apathy when he was at Bristol Myers Squibb. I read a book called Goliath's Revenge. It's all about digital transformation. And it, it's about big companies having to look at small, nimble companies and partnering with them to do digital transformations. So when I was talking to the, the big Goliaths of the industry, I asked, who's David? And this, a name came up consistently, Recursion Pharmaceutical. So then I, yes, yes. <laughs> Gee, we, we have a, a whole contingency here. So I went out and then met the people at Recursion Pharmaceutical and this really convinced me that there is no digital, there's no digital transformation without data transformation. And there is no data transformation without data ownership. So who's gonna own the data? Who is going to be the steward of that data and taking it through? So I'm gonna give you a, a few thoughts to cue this talk up, and then I'll hand it over to Mason to uh, really tell you the in-depth story. Okay. Move the slides. Touching the button. Oh, oh this one. Big green arrow. Okay. So, again, this is all about me. And uh, I am passionate. I was a former product manager myself. So I really relate to this role of the product manager uh, really shepherding the value through the chain. Now, according to the Boston Consulting Group, 70% of digital transformation efforts fall short of their objectives. Now, it's an, there's an interesting, when you, you think about this for a second, we may have heard this somewhere before. Five years ago, I could have replaced digital transformation with data lakes. And five years before that, we could large IT enterprise implementations fail. All of these things are failing and not achieving the objectives that they need because of adoption. And I'll be honest with you, I've been in this industry for 20 years. If I had a dollar for every time I was interviewing some of you in this room and asked about solutions that you get from IT, and I hear, well, they throw it over the fence at us all the time, this is, this is not the way things should be done. It should be done in collaboration and cooperation with science. We're here to partner with science to accelerate it. Okay. So what have, what have we seen and heard? From my perspective, there is a significant lack of scientific fluency. When you talk to IT people, they don't understand the science. They're not fluent in the science. And if you look at large enterprises, many large enterprises have the position of business analyst. What we're missing in this marketplace 
is a scientific business analyst, somebody who understands the science, somebody who owns the understands the domain and how to shepherd all of this information. Why is it that we can have financial business analysts and we don't have that same business analytical skills related to science and scientific data? A lot of times data is generated and we're not, we just generate data as a project and we really don't have good quality. We don't have good metadata associated with that. And one of the terms that I heard from working with recursion pharmaceutical is purpose built. So when you really develop, what they do right now is they understand their workflows, they understand what they're trying to deliver out of their workflows, and they basically are handing off specifications to the data producers because rework of your data is costing you a fortune. So we have to get that right. And this is where the role of product managers come in, and you'll hear this story. There's also a lack of um, scientific literacy. A lot of executives in the C-suite really don't understand the science. Some think that digital transformation is hiring a chief digital officer and, up and go into the cloud. It isn't, it's not like that at all. So Jean Ross in her book, Design for Digital, talks about three things. The alignment of technology, processes and people. This is required for a proper digital transformation effort to be successful. For my spending time in the marketplace, looking around and talking to executives, we are spending a tremendous amount of time in this industry on technology and we're spending a lot of time on processes. Do you know that there was not one presentation in this whole meeting around people and how are we going to educate and keep, keep people current with their knowledge? So this is going to be a major problem going forward because AI and generative AI is really going to change things. And we're going to have to understand how to keep our staff fresh with their skills. The other um, lack of ownership and stewardship, this, this one gets beaten over my head by Bryn Roberts from Roche, if you know Bryn. They have this concept at Roche around being a good data citizen and citizenship and really putting together a culture. They even have data cultural managers. I spoke to one two weeks ago. I couldn't even believe they have a position of that but really taking home that we have to really think about changing the way we think and, and create data. That's critical. So this is a picture of how we view at BioTeam data. We see it, there's a phase where we're capturing it, we're refining it, we're analyzing it, and now we're reusing it. This is what a product manager needs to manage. This is supply chain thinking. There's a whole wealth of knowledge outside on how to manage supply chains. We don't have to create it, it's there. We just have to think it through. And it's not about supply chain, it's really a value chain. How do we change the narrative around data to get to the point of having value from our data. We're not getting the value that we need because we're really not managing this well. So, so what is the role of the data product manager? Tom Davenport uh, had a really nice article in Harvard Business Review to over, talking about what is the role of the data product manager. So, they oversee the entire life cycle of the data product from ideation to development to launch to maintenance. What we've done in the past, that's a product mindset when we do that. Project mindsets are all about, uh, we have a project, it has a beginning, a middle, an end. There's no life, that's the life cycle. 
on time, in budget, beginning, middle, end. That's a project. And we talk, and sometimes back in the day when I used to interview people and say, so you have a data lake. Yeah, we got 10 petabytes in our data lake. Okay, what are you doing with the 10 petabytes and is it even accessible to anybody? This is project mindset output. Product thinking outcomes, we, we over. If project managers, data product managers have to work as cross-functional team members to ensure that the product is always going back to meet the business need of the scientist. How does it track back? And it's not one scientist, because I can tell you that when, a, when your data producer is your data consumer, you have by definition a silo because there's no supply chain from beginning to end. There's no thought. This is where you have shadow IT, shadow all kinds of things all over the place where we're generating data for one single use case and one single thing. Product managers are out there understanding all the stakeholders and understanding how, who is going to use that data. What do they need? So they ensure that the products are, that they're producing. And a data, what is a data product? It could be a dashboard, it could be, a, it could be an Excel spreadsheet for that matter. It doesn't matter what form it is. If we're producing a set of data to be consumed by somebody, that process of taking something raw material and turning it into something consumable makes it a product. And we should be treating it and valuing it like that. So is it feasible? Is it viable? Is it desirable? We all, product managers have to think about these things. Is it compliant with legal? Is it just sharing? Can we, what's the KPIs? How do we monitor this over its life cycle? So we're going to generate data early on, and then eventually we might sunset that data product and move on. Something has changed. You know, generative AI has come in. Now we don't have to have spreadsheets. We just talk to Excel now. We don't even have to do anything. So all of this. Um, so that's the role of the product manager. So what are the skills to be effective at product manager? And it, communication is everything. I know from being a product manager myself, it's a very hard job because you have a lot of ownership of things, but you don't have people reporting to you. What you have to do is be very, your influencing skills are critical to building these cooperative teams where people all work together and feel like that, but they don't report to you. That's an art form, getting people to do things for you when they don't report to you. Everybody knows that, you try to that. They foster a culture of data values and thinking of an asset. So they're the champion. They're leading the way and setting the pace. Um, they encourage cross-functional collaboration. They keep their skills up and then they're continually plugged into the network so that they're constantly bringing back information to this team. So. That's data product managers. I told you I was going to not talk a long time so that you could hear the story, but it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Mason Victors from Recursion Pharmaceutical. He was the former chief product officer when I met him, and now he and I are both what we call fellows, working on special projects and doing the things that we love. So please welcome Mason Victors. And just to clarify, their fellow is something they call you when they don't know what else to call you. Um, so uh, Stan mentioned somebody who likes to shove 120 slides down your throat in 30 minutes. Buckle up. We've got 256. As any true nerd, your number of slides should always be a power of two. Um, so I'm Mason Victors. Uh, I think of myself as an accidental data scientist, software engineer, product manager. Basically nothing I have done uh, or become in my career has ever been my intention, um, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing here. Um, uh, and something I believe deeply in is in solving problems by creating reusable um, uh, product and platform solutions. So we're going to talk 
a bit today about um, a, building a, an organization that is product oriented um, here and, and, and where the strategy for the organization centers around concepts of products and platforms. Now, any good strategy for a company is ultimately rooted in that company's mission, right? Like your strategy should be in service of your why, your mission, your strategy defines your how. And Recursion's mission is to decode biology to radically improve lives. It's a pretty bold ambition that is something that we think will keep us working hard for the next five decades or more um, uh, uh, here. And in service of that mission, we, uh, we have come to realize that we have to take a different approach to, um, uh, to developing therapeutics here. Um, luckily, uh, uh, a former colleague of mine seven years ago, six years ago, identified that, um, that there was a lot uh, that had been developed in the discipline of product management in other more traditional tech uh, settings that would be of great service to us if we could adopt some of those same concepts and bring them into this tech bio company. And so, um, so, so product management has actually been a core part of recursion since, um, since late 2016 here, where we started thinking about what we were building, not as just like we're running assays, we're, we're generating data for, uh, to be able to, to find some, some hits and advance those into candidates. But ultimately, where we began focusing on building what has since been dubbed the recursion OS or the recursion operating system, which is a set of scientific and technical capabilities, products or platforms that enable quality, relatability and scale of our data in order to derive novel insights. And this, uh, just to tell you a little bit about the recursion operating system, um, in terms of the capabilities here. Over the years, we have developed our ability to, um, to, to leverage close to 50 different human cell types on our platform, um, uh, our standard platform here, using massive small molecule, well, I shouldn't say massive small molecule libraries, large small molecule libraries given the size and stage of the company, and the ability to generate um, mass, truly massive amounts of human-induced uh, pluripotent stem cells um, here. We have developed robotic automation capabilities um, that allow us to conduct uh, several million uh, wet lab experiments per week. So looking at, at uh, well over 1, 1,536 well plates um, uh, uh, conducted every week in our high dimensional phenomics assay, which has led to us generating over 23 petabytes of, of data. And this is probably already old because I put these slides together a week ago. Um, uh, uh, and so this is, this is what we believe is to be one of the world's largest um, relatable in vitro biological and chemical data sets here. This is powered also by our uh, top 500 supercomputer called Biohive. You always have to have a clever name for these things. Um, somebody came up with that one. Um, and ultimately, setting that compute capabilities uh, uh, loose on these, uh, these data sets allows us to derive uh, multiple trillions of uh, uh, relationships between these biological and chemical perturbations in our, our maps of biology as, as we refer to them. Um, uh, and these, these uh, ML-based relationships fuel our discovery engine, and those get further validated by yet additional high dimensional um, uh, 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 data sets or data modalities um, uh, here. And, and and this, this, we, we're basically creating these cycles of, of uh, um, uh, virtuous, uh, virtuous cycles of data generation and, uh, and discovery. Now, so what does this have to do with, with products, right? Um, here, it, ho hopefully it's, it's semi-obvious that, um, that looking at, uh, at this, you can see that this isn't a one-time thing, right? That's a key difference um, uh, here is, when we conduct a screening campaign for something, we're not just conducting that to generate that data to answer that particular question. We're doing it to generate data that can fuel lots of other questions down the road. It can, it can help us ask more questions, right? Um, here, and so there's that intentionality, this fit for purpose um, effort here where as we invest in these capabilities with the mindset of scale and reusability, thinking of them as, as, as a product that will be used again and again, it actually um, uh, changes the calculus of what you can do with it, 
Um, so in short, like why the recursion operating system? Well, it's ultimately because we want to improve our ability to discover potential therapeutics at a greater scale. And you might ask, well, why not put directly put your energy into discovering those potential therapeutics instead of focusing on building these, um, these products um, here? The way I like to think of it is I think of these as functions of how much you're able to discover over time. Um, and by investing more deeply in platforms and products, it's like you're bending the curve. It's like you're changing the first and second order derivatives of some function, right? Um, because if you invest in a platform, which ultimately that platform enables the creation of other products more easily, and if each product that you create enables you to discover more medicines more easily, you have high leverage by like investing, um, uh, investing in, in platforms and products. And so ultimately, those serve the purpose of increasing our ability to, uh, to discover uh, potential therapeutics. And we'll talk about some, some evidence of this, uh, this down, uh, downstream in a minute. So a key, you know, as, we, as we've been down this path for the past six, seven years of thinking about uh, products in this tech bio world, um, it, our, our thinking and knowledge and understanding has evolved over time, which, which is frankly kind of product mindset to, to begin with as well, right? There's not some like fixed beginning, fixed middle, fixed end, and you're done. It's that you're continually updating your understanding of the situation and, and updating uh, uh, your, your product requirements, so to speak. And here we've realized that at Recursion, at least, we have a number of different product types, and it's useful also to construct these or think of these in terms of different product tiers. Um, our product types that we focus on range from scientific platforms down to industrial workflows um, uh, here. And, and really, there's not a particular order to them. There's a loose order to them. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about them in terms of starting with scientific platforms here, that our science platforms are broad and they are designed to be modular and flexible to changes in the scientific use by end users. So they're, they're meant to be able to be stitched together and reused in different ways by different scientific teams to solve different problems, right? A platform is something upon which you build other solutions and other products. It's something meant to accelerate um, uh, other, other product development in many ways. And so, you know, our, our, our standard or our, I should say our flagship science platform is, um, is our uh, high throughput phenomics platform that we have built that, that allows us to, um, to basically easily create these, um, these whole genome arrayed CRISPR knockout uh, screens in multiple cell types, as well as profiling our compounds across many cell types, not in univariate assays, but in these high dimensional imaging assays um, uh, that, that fuel our, our maps of biology that we create. Another example, if you look down below at this little GIF I have, comes from our Invovomics platform, which is um, the development and integration of, of hardware and software and, and scientific protocols to allow the, uh, us to digitize our in vivo um, studies and, and models at recursion, which is extremely powerful when it comes to identifying early signs, for example, of in vivo toxicity or liabilities there. These um, and these platforms, again, the key thing here is that they are meant to be leveraged in uh, uh, in standardized or like modular ways to accelerate the creation of other other products here. So there's not, for example, just one thing that is is done with the Phenomics platform or the Invovomics or our Trexeek platforms, but multiple things, uh, multiple products rest upon these. Next, we have digital platforms. And of course, any talk about a digital platform uh, is incomplete without the gratuitous video of somebody walking in a server room and like typing on some keyboard um, there. You always have to have that. Um, but our digital platforms um, are the underlying technology frameworks and architectures, um, as well as interfaces upon which other end user facing products can be added. So, you know, one, one thing that I, I feel personally was a game changer for recursion is when we started like deeply thinking about our engineering infrastructure as a platform and how to how to set that up as a platform so that other products could be uh, launched far more effectively and taking it from uh, each product is its own special snowflake to identifying those common standard routes 
to be able to develop and, and launch and deploy those easily. Our data lake um, is a digital platform um, providing uh, frameworks and architectures and, and ways for users to be able to systematically access that data to build other products resting upon that data um, uh, here. Our software applications, this is typically what we think of when we think of products. If we're not thinking of some physical product, we were often thinking of like an app on your phone or something like that. And our software applications are products that are context specific and narrow in per more narrow, narrower is a hard word to say, narrower in purpose than platforms, right? They are now focusing in not on like a general reusable framework that lots of other products can be built upon, but they are solving a particular problem. Right, and and that's what they're they're oriented to, and so here, you know, I I I uh, uh, throw up just some examples of of, of gifts of our of some of our software products that basically are are meant to be interfaces in for our users to answer and solve particular problems in the drug discovery process at Recursion. Some of these things. Um, you know, this, this talk was titled Data Product Management, right? And I kind of think, well, most of these things are about data, and if they're not about data, they're about data, um, like at the end of the day, right? So some of these things, the thing in the top left here is, is a, a tool built at Recursion called Experiment Delight, which is centered around, the, it, it's not you're, not, you're not analyzing data with that, but you are making it easy to generate data from that. It's, an exper it's a scaled experiment design tool that allows us to, to design these effectively, you know, millions of biological experiments every single week with appropriate controls and, and everything and, and just have that work effectively here. Um, and so, you know, these, these software applications, they're either built with a purpose of making it easier to generate data, or they're built to process that data, or they're built to convey that data um, uh, to, to end users here in a number of different ways. Now, all of these types of products ultimately get stitched together in what we deem to be, you know, maybe like a meta product, an industrialized workflow is what we call about or call them. And, and these are basically a series of standardized processes consisting of a series of applications or digital or scientific platforms, along with you know, all of these flows that connect them together. So it's once you have all of those pieces built as platforms or products, then you can stitch them together to create effective workflows for, um, for, for whatever your purpose is. And now you'll look at these and see like, well, like nothing, most of this is not new. You know, we, we do hit to lead, we do lead optimization. We evaluate our candidates, we do IND preparation. Absolutely. Um, and what I'm trying to highlight is what is often deemed to be a very, uh, can be a very manual and human centered approach can be standardized by leveraging platforms and products here um, that, that effectively turn this into a, a less bespoke venture, but more of a, a, a standardized and, and frankly industrialized um, uh, venture. Now I talked uh, uh, about I talked a bit about uh, different types of products here. I want to spend uh, just a minute on product tiers um, here. This is a, an important concept that I think often we we under acknowledge, um, which is that products will go through a life cycle and they will need to get arrive at different levels of maturity depending on your product needs. Not all products need to be that shiny app experience. That, uh, um, that we often interface with. Um, some products, it's okay that they're a bit clunky. It's okay that they're a bit rough around the edges. Um, ultimately, products are meant to solve a particular problem and to solve that problem in an appropriate way, um, uh, uh, but, but still a consistent way here. And so our products might mature over time from being a prototype, which is, we often talk about it as like throwing spaghetti on the wall and you find out what sticks um, there. And when you find out that something is sticking, we invest a bit more in that because that's telling us there's demand. The users are saying, this is useful. It is solving my problem, right? And again, this is a key aspect of product mindset is not assuming that you know what the ultimate end state should be from the beginning because odds are you don't. Odds are you need that iterative feedback from your users um, to tell you more of this, less of that. Um, here. And so if you if you approach it from a project mindset, you might think, well, I know exactly what this is. I'm going to scope this all out up front and we're going to create this timeline. We're going to deliver this thing. And you don't want to deliver something that nobody actually wants and uses, right? So deliver a slice, find out how the users like it. And if they, if they like it more, if it's useful, if it's valuable, iterate further on that. 
and and then and then invest further. And eventually, you know, we get to our our, our flagship products that that are 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 meant to be you know more of that fully uh, 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 powerful user experience um, and like deep perpetual uh, uh, problem uh, problem solving there. Um, so know your tier, set your expectations appropriately for for yourself, for your builders, and for your users. So what has been the impact of product-centric delivery um, at Recursion? Um, ultimately, it has led us to create these products, platforms, and, and ultimately teams of people that accelerate the creation of a rich pipeline of drug discovery programs and clinical candidates, which continues, uh, continues to grow. We are excited to announce another um, uh, uh, an, an advanced candidate recently, um, which, is, uh, which ultimately comes from these products and platforms that have been built at Recursion. Now, how do you achieve product-centric delivery? This is kind of a paradox here that your, your, your why becomes, your, let's see, how do, how do I put this? Um, your why becomes, uh, it, it's, it's your initial motivation, but it also becomes like the thing that pushes you along further. So if, why do you want product-centric delivery? Because typically you want to have scale. Um, you want to have reusability. You don't want to be reinventing the wheel each time. Um, well, how do you achieve that product-centric delivery? By beating the drums of scale and reusability, right? Um, if you're saying like, we, if you're constantly reminding yourself and your organization that you're not just doing one thing once, you're trying to do this in a repeated way, then that forces people to think down this product route as well um, uh, here. So if you keep your eye focused on scale and on, on reusability, that actually helps uh, drive product-centric delivery, which ultimately drives scale and reusability um, there. So again, connect with your why ultimately for, for going down a product-centric route. Organization is a key piece here. Um, oops, I went back. Um, organization is a key, key, a key piece. Um, what we have found in this non-traditional setting is that it's key to focus in on cross-disciplinary teams as the fundamental unit of, of product delivery. And these are very non-traditional teams. Um, uh, or at least they, they were five years ago. They're becoming more uh, accepted now um, uh, uh, in this current era. You've got to focus on hiring and growing product managers. Now, I, I say both. It's not just about hiring them, but also growing them. We've found that sometimes our, our most effective product managers have been those with no formal product management experience at all, but who have a product mindset, they show that they can think in this way and they have bring some domain experience and knowledge. And that has been a recipe for success. Other times we find people that have good product management experience and also have like peripheral domain knowledge that's relevant to, um, to where we design them. But that combination has been really key in this, um, this tech bio world. So what I would say is I would not go so far as say, just go hire anybody that has a product management title from any other company because you will likely find people without domain, some domain specific knowledge that that uh, can be really really valuable here um i am running out of time i did not go through the 256 slides nearly as fast as i thought um uh, some quick pitfalls to avoid in in, in tech bio product management and really all of these are, are I, I could say these about product management generally be really clear about your roles Make sure you understand the roles here and that you're, you're unambiguous in how you declare these, right? Effective product teams require at least three, you know, uh, I, I would say collaboration between three roles. They might not all, always be three separate individuals, but somebody that is focused on the product management, somebody that is, fo that is acting as a technical or a scientific lead that is focusing on the how, and the people managers that, that are helping coordinate the entire teams and make sure that the, the teams are staffed with effective, um, uh, effective people given the, the mandate of the team. And make sure that, that you have strong partnership in these key, key roles and that there's, uh, there's no role ambiguity. Another key thing is we have to make sure that, that we do the bottom, not the top, you know, as, as, as you go this, this route here, right? If you're trying to solve a problem, make sure you know what that problem is so you can create an appropriate solution given your limited resources that you have. Um, one thing I like to, to I, I tailor this since we're in Boston here. If you need to get to the moon, build a rocket ship. If you need to get to Providence, Rhode Island, build a car, right? Don't build a rocket ship to go to Providence, Rhode Island. And if you only need to go there once, walk, you know, like, and so like understand like what you really need here and don't like misengineer your product. 
Okay, last, last pitfall to avoid, misassigning expertise. This is a key thing, I think, when it comes to effective product delivery. You have to understand who are the experts in what. The users, they are typically the experts in their problems. The builders, the software engineers, the scientists, they're often experts in the solution space. A lot of tension occurs when people think they're the expert in the other thing, right? Um, so like make sure you understand like as a product manager or who your product manager should be listening to for what parts of this journey. They should be listening to the users to understand the problems, the builders to understand the solution space here. Um, I am out of time, so I am unfortunately going to blast uh, uh, blast uh, past, uh, past that slide here, but I want to talk just briefly about um, kind of a, 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 a story of going from zero to one for a product over the, uh, the past six months where we were tasked with, um, with developing an industrialized workflow that stitches together many of our existing products and platforms and capabilities here. And, um, and ultimately what we had to do is, is, is basically spend some time thinking about this as a product of understanding initially or doing some discovery on the users and their needs, their problems, not just identifying what the users are saying their problems are, but also identifying the, the, uh, the, the non-obvious users, the hidden users um, here. And that's a really important thing to design for. Um, for. In this case, we wanted to make sure that our data became our fuel, not our exhaust, right? And our users, what they were asking for was not necessarily that, but we were thinking of future us and, and what that need would be. Have to create a product delivery plan, but know that that plan is going to change, right? It's the planning part that is valuable. The plans are going to change and then iteratively deliver on that product, updating as you get feedback from your users all along the way. Um, and with that, my time's up. I just want to acknowledge uh, many of the current and past recursion knots that have, um, have influenced my understanding of product management uh, in this space. And that's it, sorry.